here for the Modern Priestess Movement conversation. I am here with Sarah. Um, I have been following your work, Sarah, uh, for it seems like for a while now, but um, following just kind of your daily blogging and um, expressing on Facebook, and I just adore you. So thank you so much for being here. Adoration totally mutual. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Um, so today we were chatting just a little bit before we started recording and kind of this theme of rebirth and shadow work, um, leaning into the dark goddess when we need her, um, exploring the duality of feeling both really full and really empty are all things that felt uh, pretty relevant for both of us, I would say. And um, I want to first ask you, um, I was sharing, I'm feeling very tired and very full, very empty, but very ready. A lot of these like um, kind of duality feelings that are living inside me right now. And you said that you have had that experience or could speak to that a little bit. So I'd, I'd love to kind of start in sharing there, this like duality that we're always <laughs> working with. Um, how yeah. are you doing that? How are we doing that? How are we as a doing that? I feel like this has been um, a big year in the collective and in my personal life too of mending um, polarities and, and yeah. bringing together opposing and contradictory energies and being able to hold both at once within ourselves. And I think that there's all these, um, the feels that come along with that, all yeah. these amazing experiences that move through the vessel of our bodies and beings as we um, expand and extend our capacity to be both and. Mm -hmm. We used to be in an either or scenario much mm -hmm. more. I think. Yes. We're moving into a both and scenario as a as the feminine grows her her power because she is um, all encompassing. Like her arms, there's nothing that her arms are not wrapped around, yeah. and and so we can be both empty and full at once. We can be both tender and fierce at once. Mm -hmm. um, we learn how to hold these opposites. So. I think it's just all the different ways that we then play with that in our own, you know, human personal experience in order to uh, to grow into her, to grow into the magnificence of being both of those things at once. Yeah. Um, and for me personally, this has been a huge year of, of dissolving, and um, I've always been someone who, as someone probably pretty highly empathic and uh, someone who easily channels, you know, I consider myself sort of an oral, oracle or a channel much of the time. Mm -hmm. The project of selfhood has been really big for me, like creating boundaries, creating sovereignty, creating structure around what is the self in order to be um, an able vessel to receive yeah. through without being in a state of chaos, personal chaos, mm -hmm. or, or being so worn and ragged that we can't do the work effectively. So mm -hmm. again, it's this dichotomy of self and selflessness mm -hmm. that we have to have this really well-formed self in order to be selfless in service. Okay. And they are, it's a both and, mm -hmm. again. And I, I think that that's how it always is. And to be full, we must empty. You know, empty to be full, uh, selfless to be selfed or vice versa. So to me, it just we're exploring. For some reason, this year in particular was the year of the paradox for me, where we just got to experience. You know, many of us um, and me personally deeply got to experience. You know, playing with all of those supposed opposites and really noticing that they're not opposite at all. Mm, yeah. What has been? Um, what's been your biggest takeaway this year? What's been like the? Um... I guess the the lesson or the knowing that's come through for you. Oh yeah. Woo! I think home, home has been the biggest lesson. I've I've always been on a journey of embodiment, and it's just so interesting because I think a lot of the spiritual rhetoric is about ascending, mm -hmm. and is about um, going some place else, mm -hmm. you know, becoming enlightened, becoming you know these these um, goals, spiritual goals, and I think. My project or my mission has always been the opposite of, of incoming and embodying. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that I choose more than to be in a human body mm -hmm. here with you right now, to breathe here and really be here. Yeah. So the, the project for me this year has been coming home, really coming home. 
mm. of the nitty gritty, you know, of being deep in your body, um, and the the pain that we hit on the way in because yeah. of the traumas that are held here, and because of you know the world that we're living in right now, and what a project it is to be present to that much intensity, that much pain, that much grief, that much joy, that much beauty. None of it separate from any of the other, again, no dualities, but to really be present with that. So just before we started this interview, I just gave my husband a huge hug and a kiss, and I just said, I'm home with you. You are my king. There's not one part of me that doesn't want to be right here with you right now Mm -hmm. anymore, you know? And for me, there always has been elements of there's been distraction and there's been dissipation and... Mm-hmm. Soul adventures. Mm-hmm. I, I don't discount any of it. It's always been an adventure. But um, as someone who's experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of that stems from brokenness. And coming back into presence, you know, is the ultimate project for me. Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, okay, so coming back home. There was something as you were speaking, I remembered something that you wrote, maybe it was a few weeks ago. Um that resonated with me so deeply. Um, earlier this year, it seemed like the queen archetype was like, oh, like every, and I love, I was full in, I'm still full in on the queen archetype. I love her. I love playing with it. Um, and that's definitely when I'm doing my work. I step into that. That's a really powerful. But you wrote something around kind of like setting the crown down and you were fine just to be like here I am naked and here and that's enough and like I don't even need my crown because everything I've got going on right now is what I want um so is that kind of tying into this theme of home this theme of I I have it all already it's all right here I think so I think the queen you know maybe we wear the crown when we're when we're in the state of um, you know, em- embodying, wanting to embody that magnificence, but maybe the magnificence itself starts to sometimes become a form or a burden mm-hmm. or an identification mm-hmm. in a way that no longer feels necessary. Yeah. It starts to feel like, like if you watch, my, you know, our, any of our kids play, they put the crown on, it's, it's for play and, and it's... Yeah. But it is, but when they take it off, it's forgotten and it's gone, and then they're off chasing a butterfly. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just really important for us to be super light on our on our feet with these these forms and archetypes, so that they don't start to feel heavy and yeah. crusty. Is the word I want to use? You know it's what I mean? <laughs> In some way, because we're flo- so fluid. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I, you know, I, there came to me a point when you know, and it was just, it's so ironic to me because whenever I go through one of these things, like. For a while, I was just raging the dark goddess, and then the minute everybody wants to talk dark goddess, I just don't have any, I didn't feel her anymore, and I was just pure water, mm-hmm. pure tenderness, you know, for that time period. And the kind of same thing happened with the queen archetype. People were like, come be the queen at this, you know, and talk about being the queen, and I'm like, I'm just Sarah, like, making macaroni and cheese in my kitchen mm-hmm. with the refrigerator magnets, Yeah. You know? yeah. and I'm like as down home and as as natural and as just, you know, free as I can be within that. And there was a whole lot of crying involved in that process for me. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this last year has been a lot about dissolving all those forms, which has been through the process of grief, through the process of heart opening, like my heart exploded this last year Mm -hmm. Um, in a beautiful way, but a way that I was not prepared for. And I am, I'm just starting to unpack the gifts of like understanding that that's what it really has been about all along that I could look you that much more deeply in the eyes and I could share, you know, goosebumps with you in this moment. Mm-hmm. You know, that was really the entire reason that my heart had to shatter and that the crown had to fall. And, you know, I've talked a lot about Inanna this last year and how she volunteered to go to the underworld to be stripped. Mm. And I understand what that gift is. I'm starting to understand it. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to tell us, tell us a little bit more about Inanna? I actually have her in a frame right here. Can I, I'm going to show a picture of her because I literally just put her in a frame before our call today. 
which I think is kind of wild. So I'm going to bring her over. Um, yeah, I was looking through my deck and every once in a while, some of them make it into a frame. Um, so this is the photo that I have of her. Um, yeah, I'm trying to get the glare off there, but anyway, so just what a little visual. Say? What does what, it actually say? The it word? says embracing the shadow. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, tell us a little bit about her because I just put her in there cause I was like, huh, I want to know more about you. What are you about? I don't, I don't know much about her. Um, Am I? I just lived, I profoundly have lived her and I wasn't really super well acquainted with her either and I have done so much shadow work and heavily, heavily, you know, engaged with all of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Facebook is dinging, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and she just, basically she's the queen of heaven. Um, this is what I know of her. I'm not really, I kind of live the myths more than I ever read them, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm not, I, I like that version better. No, let's do the Sarah version. This is way Yeah, more I'm fun. not Wikipedia yeah. on the topic, but <laughs> I figured that's there. Um, you know, she's the queen of heaven who, again, has the big crown and, and the adornments and the makeup and the jewels and mm -hmm. the, and has everything and is as wealthy as can be and has a husband and, you know, the king. Um, and she volunteers to take this crazy descent through seven gates into the deep underworld, the depths of the deep underworld. Mm -hmm. And no one really knows why she's doing it, I think. Like, she just is like, I need to have this experience. And on the way down through each of the gates, she's stripped of one of her adornments. The crown comes off, mm -hmm. the jewels come off, the clothes come off, everything comes off. So by the time she reaches the depths, she's bare, completely bare. And, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, in the underworld, she... I think she meets her her sister, her twin sister, who is her dark, her dark mm -hmm. half. This is how I understand it. Okay. And she has to merge with her own. The, the sister actually kills her, but I see it as being a merge, right. merging. Right. Mm -hmm. um, she volunteers to die, sort of, in this experience to merge with her, her darkness, and um, it's kind of brutal. She's like hanged on a meat hook. It's it's pretty awful. It's and a lot of these like old stories are you know they they just get kind of crazy yeah gruesome this is a really you know really hairy one so and a very very old one I think mm -hmm. yeah. the, you know, Greek myths and everything so mm -hmm. um eventually she has to there's people who love her and they sort of supplicate you know for her to her, her return mm -hmm. and I can't remember how it is but she's given something I think magical elixir or magical water that revives her and she has to make her way back out again, and as she does, she's restored, you know, all of her, yeah. so she's restored sort of plus, you know? Right, with all of her experiences, and yeah. yeah. Now okay. she owns all the bareness, and she's integrated her own, her own darkness, and she's, she, she owns death, she's now queen of the underworld as well, mm -hmm. as heaven, as the heavenly realm, so again, it's this marriage of opposites, but no one knows why she does that in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> oh That's yeah for the last year and I'm just like this is obviously an adventure that I needed and I'm still as I say I'm still unpacking the gifts of that yeah yeah you know so I was actually this is great so <laughs> this is so synchronistic today uh right before our call I ha I'm a big fan of the book the Sophia Code have you read this yet I have not. Okay, so I just opened it up to a page before our call, and I had mentioned before we started recording, I was like, do you want to talk about Mary Magdalene? Because I opened up that book and read about Mary Magdalene and her chapter, um, and she uh, kind of mentored or invoked um, Inanna a lot as well, because she had a lot of darkness in her um, that she and darkness that she saw in others that she didn't know what to do with. So, and what I was reading is that she would invoke Inanna and Sekhmet and these other uh, archetypes to just kind of help like rip it out and transfuse it and like gnarly it up and, you know, either like completely destroy it or transfuse it um, mm -hmm. into light. And yeah. um, so, you know, when I think of Mary Magdalene, I think of such a great balance of both the beauty, the sensuality, the sexuality, um, confidence, feminine, with 
this shamanic healer that she was and being able to transform um, those denser energies through energy, energy work and stuff. So um, I'm a big fan is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and I always think of her when I follow your work. I, I see the two of you is very connected. Um, so uh, do you want to speak about your re either relationship with her or what you know or relate to with her? Yeah, sure. I love Mary Magdalene. She is definitely at the core of my work and, and mm -hmm. essence, and I feel her with me. Yeah. The time. Um, and I had an active relationship with her. She showed up and just literally was like, I want to tell you things, and mm -hmm. I want to let you feel me and yeah. feel yourself as me. And it was kind of funny because it happened in relationship to a person in my life who was kind of holding the Jesus archetype. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In a very funny way. Mm -hmm. It's this book, too. It's, it's, it's humorous. It's like we're fumbling around at, at Jesus and Mary and trying to figure out, like, who are you compared to what really is me? Like, are we, do we really understand? Because it's kind of like the gospel version, you know, wanting to go back into the, the archetypal. Um, you know, Gnostic, more Gnostic mythology. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a funny play between those two things. But, yeah. but she showed up in my life and was like, I'm going to teach you everything about how to love yourself and how to have yeah. um, core, the core lesson to love yourself and to make love to God. Mm -hmm. That is really the core of her, as I understand her. And that's where the alchemy comes from and through is her relationship and her ability to, to know everything as love making with, with God. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and I see her, her darkness as being this rounded womb space sensuality, very sacral, very, um, very, very rounded. It doesn't feel harsh and scary and fraught like the Anana story quite so much. Mm -hmm. It's like she's more in sort of smoothed mastery yeah. of that darkened space mm -hmm. within herself, so perhaps because she's integrated Inanna and, and, you know, these earlier um, feminine archetypes who, who paved the underworld for us and did some of the brutal brutal work around that, um, for, her, for me, when, I, when I'm in her and with her, it just feels like this very profound, grounded, essenced space that can, you know, it's a crucible or it's a... What is it? It's, just, it's an alchemical vessel. Yeah. Whatever you pour into it will be um, infused with, you know, with this God, uh, this God, this love, this love for God, love of God, and that it will emerge, you know, purified and, and holy. Mm. Purified isn't even the word I want to use because I don't think there's anything to purify within her. It's just more like infused with holiness, mm -hmm. magical, yeah. magical holiness. Yeah. So, and my husband and I now, like, I see Hannah as being very much, um, I call him the righteous teacher, you know, the, the early um, pre-Christian Jesus. Right, yeah. So there was kind of the Jesus, you know, who actually was a Jewish shaman, I'm going to call him. I know, I, well, I personally think of him as like a yogi, right? Like that's where, and I know that's, that's like maybe not... I don't know if there's like a right or wrong way around it, but yeah, when I think of him, it's definitely more of like a shaman, a yogi, a um, shamanic healer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very earthy and embodied mm -hmm. as I, as we uh, relate in that. So we have a fun relationship of, of that, you know, Mary Magdalene and, and righteous teacher, you know, slash Jesus, um, archetypal play within our relationship that really grounds um, much of what, bonds us in our in our energetic work together and um and she i think understood something about the very very early jewish tradition which again is more like a shamanic practice if you go back far enough mm -hmm. those things are if you go back far enough right you know? <laughs> yeah and um at the core of the the whole the center of the holy of holies the shekinah i don't know if you're familiar with like the shekinah and her yeah she but I think Mary Magdalene had a relationship with, with the Shekinah, which is the, the goddess within Judaism. That was kind of building a bridge, you know, east-west bridge, if you will, or a bridge between the matriarchy and what would be called the patriarchy 
And I feel like there was, this is kind of a little bit esoteric, but I feel like there was a divine spark at that moment in that relationship that became divine union, Mm -hmm. but the world wasn't ready to know yet. And it got suppressed. It got suppressed in the form of the grail. It got suppressed in the form of Mary Magdalene running off to France and having to flee for her life and death of Jesus. And, you know, all of this is related. Yeah. But the thread of that has not been lost. Mm -hmm. The thread of that lives on in us when we embody Mary. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of, we walk around kind of kingmakers as, you know, that's another feature of Mary. Yeah. Mary Magdalene to me is she's a kingmaker because she reminds the masculine of that moment of divine union mm-hmm. and her very essence is sort of like an invitation, like, I make love to God. Are you yeah. him? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Kind of has that essence to it, but in a very knowing way. Like, oh, yeah. We can sort of take you or leave you, but are you God or aren't you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? A lot of discernment. A lot of discernment. Of discernment. And, yeah. a lot, and a lot of invitation. Mm-hmm. Within the discernment, like, a loving opportunity. Yeah. She's yeah. A, she is a walking, loving opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so I was thinking about the rose when you were talking, which then... Um, I believe the the sisterhood that you have curated online is the Rose Chalice. Is that still um, something that you're working on? Yes. Okay. Rose Chalice. It's yeah. a very intimate little group right now of about only 50 of us or maybe 60, somewhere in there. And it's it's very, um, very intimate right now and very deep. Yeah. Uh, and it's about all that we're talking about, going into the deep shadows, like the sexual energy, the, you know, learning the essence of Mary. Um, what I love about my group right now, this group, is that it's being, people come in, the women who are showing up are experiencing radical transformation. Yeah. So it's not a casual space right now, and that's why I think it has maintained a smallish size, too, which is probably good. Mm-hmm. But it's like so heart activating and opening that those of us who are doing that work at that level are experiencing just like huge you know, explosive, I'll call it even, um, transformation, yeah. in, you know, and that, that sacred little alchemical well, space. I think when women gather, even in those online containers, there's this energy that kind of starts that we all then infuse into our lives. And so things start real, like you have these other women holding a vision for you and holding um, sometimes intentions for you that... I think that there's a lot of power in that. When you have this uh, collective who has your back and you can go, you can really open your heart and really say, this is what I'm working on. This is where I'm trying to get my needs met. And then you have that tribe of women behind saying, yes, you deserve that. Yes, we support you with that or, you know, whatever uh, it may be. I've noticed that when when I invoke my girlfriends and say, like, this is what I'm manifesting or like, this is what I'm changing. This is what I'm transforming into. It happens so fast when I claim it to my sisters. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of magic in that in sisterhood and manifesting together, whether you realize you're doing it or not. (laughs) Huge magic. And I think too, that this is like a safe space to go into all of those crazy cracks and crevices within our own beings and psyches that we don't usually get to visit because there's literally Mm -hmm. There has been kind of a moratorium on safe space. Um, like, I feel it's kind of purposeful that the way we've been asked to live is, is so isolated. So in order to extract from us, uh, to create desire, to create pain, an artificial situation of pain so that they can commodify the life force, essentially, yeah. and sell us things. So there's been, you know, like my journey has involved... Um, depths that couldn't be held anywhere, anywhere, like you couldn't go to the church, you couldn't go to your family, you couldn't go to any workplace, you couldn't go to, Mm -hmm. you know, a bar, don't even think about that. There's literally no safe space to navigate certain types of wounds. Mm -hmm. And as I went through my journey, I was like, this is a real, a real hole in the, the repertoire. So it's, yes, it's, it's a manifesting thing, but it's also a, like a really, really deep soul diving Mm. A place where you could say all the things, you know, about loathing, about self-loathing, about, you know, confusion, about, you know, whatever it is. And somebody's going to be like, that's okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just, that's okay. It's okay that you feel that. There's no, I'm not going to try to fix you here. I don't do that here. But just to let you know that you're seen and it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having your feelings. I mean, usually if you show up at, let's say you show up at a a doctor's office that way, they're going to medicate you. Oh, yeah. If you show up at a church, they're going to try to save you. Mm-hmm. You know, an on yeah. and on and on. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that simple reflection of just, um, this is something that my mentor would say. Just like, well, thank you for having your feelings. Thank you for feeling those feelings. And then it would be like, oh. And then it just, felt, I was like, okay, well. Yeah. Yeah. I do. And and that was it, right? And then that's like, sometimes that is it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just really powerful. Women are starting to remember how to do that for one another, I think. Exactly. That's kind of what the core of this space is all about, um, just to re-establish that type of depth. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it's a see that grows yeah. in the positive. And, you know, so that I think when we parse those deep shadows, I mean, you could spend years, you could spend a whole lifetime suppressing that, but if you spend one hour illuminating it and being with it, it can literally transform your life in an hour. Yeah. yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we always have the choice to do, yeah, we always have that choice. Where right now, I've noticed it's like, okay, I can um, I can work through this really fast if I want, or I can take my time. Like, I feel like we've reached a point where this opportunity for healing, all, like, the resources are now available in a way that they weren't even five years ago. Mm-hmm. there's groups like yours there you know there's the there are places to go now and um and anyway so this is um I'm not sure where I was going with that but just like in a, on a personal level when I see someone who's like I really want to make a change it can happen so fast right because more of us are coming into this like feminine uh energy that can be so healing and it's just like uh it's everything right now for women. Exactly. It's it's the mother, you know, it's the mother who will say no matter what, like, I love you, and, and it's okay, and, mm. you know, we have all carried the mother wounds and the sister wounds, and yeah. many of us were not mothered that way, right. I, I didn't really have a mother, you know, for most of my childhood, so I, those were things that I, I taking little mental notes, like, this mm-hmm. is what I want to be, yeah. you know, I want to be that one, I, like, when I was in dire, dire pain, um, and I'd go to the bookstore and there wasn't a single book on the shelf that would really represent what my experience was. That was the book that I, that I just wrote, which is, you know, now going to be self-published. I was going to ask you about that. How is the book coming along? It is finally coming along. So it had okay. a really long up and down, you know, I, I put it in some other people's hands in terms of like timelines and like, you know, different publishers and agents were like playing with it and looking at it. My book is, it's raw. It's really raw. Like, it's it's eat, pray, love, you know, with all of the, like, spaghetti and the, the cute the cuteness stripped away. Like, it is just raw. Like, mm-hmm. I've taken off all the bells and whistles. Kind of like the Anana thing. Yeah. And cute in it. <laughs> yeah, stripped that down. Yeah. It's funny, but it is it is truth-bearing, and it is, it is something that the populace has not really seen before that I have... Um, read, mm-hmm. you know, it goes to a different level of tell all and um, again the shadow work and and the mm-hmm. claiming and the, the authorship of that. So it had an interesting little ride because everyone who um, there were agents who were interested in it and there were publishers, but whenever they would read it, they'd get massively triggered by my book. And a few of them actually ended up with like major healing crises and like their whole life like went kerfluing on them. <laughs> And they were terrified of me and, you know, so I've gone through rounds of this and just, it's, it's kind of like tragic, com- a tragic comedy, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm now self-publishing. I'm really excited and it's on its way. It should be out within a matter of a few months, which is great because I have like three or four more that I'm dying to write right now. Great. Oh, good. Yeah. I have so much content in me and I feel like yeah, you know, my daughter, who's eight, just designed my book cover. Mm. She did a brilliant job, and my husband took the photo for the cover. And it's like all really us, and everybody's like, 
you really should go professional and you should really have a graphic designer and you should really, and I'm just like, it's just us. Yeah. You know, this is just me and this is how it should be. Like no, there's no polish on it. There's no veneer. Well, and then that's going to make it such an accurate mirror to look at, right? Like if somebody really wants the medicine that you have to offer, like don't smear like lipstick all over it and like not let us really get the full reflection, you know? So I think that that's awesome. Yeah, it is, and it's it's the truth of who I am. I just, you know, I don't brand well. <laughs> <laughs> the the like personal branding, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm allergic. My my cells are allergic to those kinds of concepts. Mm-hmm. So whenever I try to go down more conventional routes, I find my own self. I'm triggering everyone. They're triggering. It's just like a funny little thing that happens every time. I get it. I um actually so one of the conversations and I tagged her in a. A thread we were talking in on Facebook but Layla she did a video and it was the one that brought me I started just crying as she was talking because she broke that down and was just like we're not doing that anymore you know I'm like no that's not how we're gonna run things and she was just so like okay. sure of it it was so good and I just could feel the people who were gonna like listen in that in that permission giving of like yeah don't do it that way don't do it that way. It's like, that's so the old paradigm. Like, don't, you know, like do you and do what's authentic for you. And just the way that she presented it, I totally hear that. I, um, I for a long time was trying to fit myself into like, okay, well I gotta have the, like everything automated and like all these pieces that I was like really trying to put together. I'm very like logical person and it just wasn't working. It was not working. Um, and yeah, for me personally, I could do it for other women. Like I could see them and see their story and like I could somehow communicate their story. But when it came to me, I was just, there was something there that I wasn't, it wasn't clicking. So I completely, and so I just stopped. I was like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm just going to do the priestess work. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just only do what feels good. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Oh, Because sometimes awesome. we make ourselves sick by not listening, you know? Oh and yeah. We- I've been there. And yeah. that's the masculine feminine thing too, because the way we all, you know, do business and the way we push mm-hmm. ourselves into the world has a lot of that not that there's anything wrong with the masculine, but it's it can be this very overstructured and very overactive and Yeah, like over penetrating. Over penetrating and over commodified mm-hmm. and you know, mm-hmm. I think it's so refreshing to just be able to meet in a space to just be in presence with someone who's like here I am. Mm-hmm. Here's the offering. Yeah. This is my raw truth, you know, mm-hmm. coming from my heart. And that takes guts. It takes guts to not put 20 coats of veneer on it and yeah. shellac. Yeah. You know, yeah. all the bells and souls. And it's not that there's anything wrong with that. I don't, I don't judge any offering that comes through. But I just personally, like, I've always been the one who will take it to a degree of, of rawness and authenticity that other people are like, whoa, you know, and I can't do it any other way. Mm -hmm. It's the wildness. It's the wildness in me. Yeah. You know, in us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being that wild woman. We need more. We need more of the wild woman. I like it. Um, Okay. So the book is on its way. We will keep everyone posted about that then. Um, Thank you for your time. And where, okay, so we, you know, you post your, uh, you're writing on Facebook a lot, so we should follow you on Facebook, right? How can we do that? Um, it's just go to Sarah Sophia Eisenman, which is my just my personal Facebook page, and just okay. either send a friend friend request or or like, yeah. uh, follow, and yeah. and I'm right now I'm in major transition, so I am I'm funky right now on on Facebook. I'm like my voice is changing, everything's changing, so I'm just letting it, yeah. just moving and being with it. But um, the Rose Chalice, too, is another great space to meet, and it's right. very simple, like, $11 a month subscription fee, which I kept, like, really, really minimal so people could just, you know, come and partake of that easily, women. Mm-hmm. It's a women's only group, but it's really designed to, as I say, hold that super deep space, and um, and everybody there is creating, which is really exciting. Like, people make their own, women make their own video offerings to contribute to the group. There's a book mm-hmm. club that's spontaneously formed. There's... Um, there's a, a workshop that's happening next summer solstice that is being, you know, just sort of organically and spontaneously arranged where everybody's coming together 
And I'm not doing it. I am not driving. My hands are totally off the wheel. That's good. You're just holding the container, though, and that somebody needs to do that, you know? And it takes a strong woman to do that. I'm there, and I'm and I'm and I'm love, and I'm like every single person here is totally gifted, and like let's let's let our gifts play with each other, and mm -hmm. let's just emerge, you know. And I just same thing I do with my kids when I'm um, homeschooling them is I create a container and like here's some crayons and here's some supplies and here's an idea and here's my love and mm -hmm. and then it's like and magic just yeah, flows yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So it's that same kind of space right now. So I, I encourage people to. Women, you know, it is a women's only group to um, come and, and be in that vibration and be loved. Cool. We'll make sure both those are in the notes here so people can click on that. Um, check it out. See um, see if they want to, to come into the Rose Chalice. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing today. Um, I know it's been kind of a emotional a uh, few weeks and I just really appreciate you showing up. It means a lot. And um, I'm sure everyone who touches your energy is, is really... Um, going to be grateful and uh, just as grateful as I am. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Talk to you soon. Okay.